Hello, this is Jim Bradshaw, wanting to continue our uh, series on Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and the backdrop for the gospel of the kingdom. Um, I want to summarize again what was discussed in Genesis 1, going into Genesis 2, as far as the first creation story that we find there. I want to illustrate or uh, speak out some summaries of what we learned there. First is, is that God exists all by himself and made creation out of nothing. Thus, God's perspective that is that all things are made or created by spiritual means, by the Spirit. Now, as I say this, if you look at verse 2 of Genesis 1, uh, the writer mentions the earth as existing, uh, though without form or void, uh, and that the Spirit hovered over the face of the waters. So you could read that and say, hey, well, those things existed as God was creating the heavens and earth. Um but that doesn't necessarily mean that they physically existed in the beginning. Their significance of what water means, you can't have life without water. They're significant as far as the earth, uh, as far as the, the uh, ideal of creation, uh, as far as uh, what God made, as far as the heavens and the earth made everything, made the universe. Uh, but what I'm trying to say here is affirmed by Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, that by faith we understand the universe was created by the word of God so that what was seen was not made out of things that are visible. That's what I'm trying to say here that I see from Genesis 1 as I summarize that God exists apart from creation. He exists all by himself, that God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth, and that God spoke and things were created by his word. God made something out of nothing. It's very important to understand that, to understand who we are as created beings, that God spoke and we existed. Of course, Genesis chapter 2 has a more particular uh, story about how we were made, it, made, and we'll talk about that. But I'm trying to emphasize who God is and what God's creation is and how creation was formed. So I want also to bring in the fact that I understand from my eighth grade science class that the scientist says matter is neither created nor destroyed. So that would go against this saying that something was made out of nothing. But the statement is true within creation. So that's the perspective of the, of the scientific statement that, that matter is not created nor destroyed. And that's true within creation. My point here is that God made something out of nothing and to understand that uh, as far as outside the physical realm, the physical realm, there's truth in that scientific statement. So I'm wanting to bring out here the recognition of conflict that may be there. And yet the understanding with perspective, perspective is everything. Perspective shapes how you see things and determine things and what you believe. So this should help us understand the scientist who believes matters is neither created nor destroyed, who as a result of this is understanding in a vacuum, does not believe in creation. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Someone who believes that creator is not that that matter is not created and destroyed within that thinking itself, that perspective, it does not allow for something to be made out of nothing, let alone a God making things. So I'm just trying to help you to understand how important perspective is. Such scientists, and not all scientists are atheists, do not understand the realm of the spirit. It just doesn't exist to such scientists. So I'm trying to help you to illustrate here that perspective is everything. So please understand that what I'm teaching here is from a word and spirit perspective. I regard the scriptures to be true and sacred and to be interpreted through revelational hermeneutical lenses, interpretive lenses, primarily through the lens of Christ with the help of the Holy Spirit. That's a teaching all in itself. Um, there's a book in all itself, but I'm trying to help you understand where I'm coming from. So God created all things with order. It's the second thing. So first thing is God exists all by himself, made creation of nothing. Second thing is God created all things with order. This creation account in Genesis 1 demonstrates an order. Just as it's been recorded, there's order in this creation story. Areas of study related to creation also demonstrate order. Now, there are some anomalies, and we'll get to that in Genesis 3. But even Genesis 3, as far as sin and fall, is does not explain all anomalies just because of that. I'm not trying to make a blanket statement there. I'm just trying to illustrate here that this story illustrates God created all things with order. 
The third thing I wanted to summarize here is that God created humanity as the crown of his creation. Let's just say, I'm interpreting here that God saved the best for last. As the crown of his creation, God blessed humanity with the charge to prosper on earth, that is to be fruitful and multiply and to replenish the earth, and also to govern, subdue and have dominion. Thus God made humanity as the stewards of his creation. And God has never intended to take that back from humanity. God is not about undoing his creation. God did not make things and said, oh, oh it didn't go right. Man messed up. I'm going to have to to fix this or undo it or take it away. God has never intended to take back the responsibility of humanity to be stewards of his creation. Instead, God is doing a new thing. God is doing a redeeming thing. God is doing a restoring thing. So believe it or not, that God not undoing his creation working through humanity for his creation illustrates the faith of God in humanity. That's why some people say that God has more faith in us than we have in him. So understand from that perspective why God is working with us for his purposes for us on the earth. So we are to be stewards of his creation according to his image in us, prospering with his faith, hope, and love, and governing with his justice and righteousness. This is the gold standard. This is the fourth part of summary. This is the gold standard. This is what creation is always meant to be. This is why now creation yearns for the sons of God to be revealed. This that's in Romans 8, 19. Our final destination as believers in Christ Jesus is not heaven, but rather a new heavens and a new earth from which we live in and govern creation from God's image in us who've been totally restored in Christ. That is what our final destination is, if you if you want to understand the, the total redemption of humanity and of all creation. So to this end, we understand the seventh day of rest, which going into chapter 2 of Genesis is finishing this creation story. It's from this place, this, this rest that we live. It is only after Genesis 3 that we work from the sweat of our brow. The seventh day is not simply a rest from working in this manner. So that's what it became in the old covenant. In the old, that, that on the seventh day, you rest from your work by the sweat of your brow to get a rest and then start your week again as the last day of the week. But rather, as the Hebrews chapter three understanding is that the seventh day is a rest of being blessed to prosper and govern with the image of God in us by means of God's spirit in us. In other words, this seventh day, according to this creation story, in perfection, no more, no, no, nothing gone wrong here. We live in that seventh day, enjoying the creation and furthering the blessing of creation for the sake of creation. And uh, that, that's the place we live. So in other words, every day is to be this Sabbath day rest in the spirit totally restored. So that's the place we uh, are to live in by the spirit. It doesn't mean we don't work six days or whatever days and have, have a rest period or so forth. It's just saying that uh, we have to understand this seventh day from the realm of the spirit, from the understanding of the spirit, from what, what the writer to the Hebrews in chapter three is understanding this seventh day rest that we enter in by the faith of God through Christ. So it's from this uh, summary that we enter into the second creation story as told in particular from a covenantal perspective. So this second creation story in chapter two is a complement through story. It illustrates the relational nature of God of which God made man to be also. So we're the crowning of creation uh, in, in this first creation story that's told. This second story then complements or, or particularizes uh, what this crowning uh, creation is. So it's all from the perspective of God and humanity. In this creation story, it's all about God making making humanity from the dust of the earth and formed in fashion and then having God breathe his spirit into man to become a living soul. All those words in the second, uh, in this Genesis chapter two story, it's just so, so many parts of who we are made by God. The uh, Hebrew word for man is Adam, and the word for ground is Adama. So Adam comes from 
Adama. So in other words, there's very much, we are part of creation. We are created. So just like God exists all by himself, we exist in relation to creation. You can't, we cannot be separated from creation in the sense of who we are to be. Yes, uh, we come from the ground, we return to the ground as far as as a result of Genesis 3. We are that, but we also know that God breathed into us his spirit. So we are spiritual beings and we become a living soul, feeling, thinking, uh, uh, creation. Uh, to govern and to rule on the earth with God's image, God's spirit in us. And so God made made us in that fashion personally to show God's uh, relational investment into us. And then even then the making of, of uh, the woman as the man is put to a deep sleep and out of man, God made woman shows again the relationship between man and woman humanity and it's and, and out of the response god's response is not good for the man to be alone we are made to be relational beings covenant relational beings and so god makes us relationally and makes us to be relational as he formed uh humanity out of his image male and female is what the first creation story says and then particularly how god made that relationship uh, in particular in this genesis 2 creation story it's very very relational very much covenant relationship very particular about male and female in this creation story about even what is said at the end of chapter 2 that uh that jesus even quotes about how uh the two shall become one between male and female, they shall be one. It's all about this covenant understanding of relationship in the image of God. So uh, at the end of chapter two, you have us, not only the, the crowning part of creation and stewards steward of creation, you have us as blessed by God in union with God, in union with one another, how we are living as one in peace and in love with one another as God made us. All is well and good as God intended for all of creation at the end of chapter two. This is the gold standard. This is what we are to be as humanity. It is this understanding that we first have to take as we consider the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom is about a restoration, a restoration to what God made in creation, a restoration of understanding how we are to rule and reign on the earth in God's image. And, uh, and the gospel of the kingdom is the good news, the good news probably about who Christ is and what he's done and what he's doing in order to restore all things. So I want to end here with that. Um, and thank you for your time and God bless you. And we will continue. Uh, this uh, this teaching. Thank you.